Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. I am so thrilled that audible.com is my new sponsor. They'll be sponsoring this whole week, and they're giving you all a free 30-day trial of Audible, which includes not only their audiobooks, which they're famous for, but also guided wellness now, podcasts, and so many Audible originals. You have to go check it out. I even have my special URL, which is audible.com slash Zibby. How cool is that? So you have to go check it out so that they know that people who are listening are actually listening to this. <laughs> audible.com slash Zibby. And you can even text Z-I-B-B-Y, all lowercase, Zibby, to 500-500 to get your free trial. So go do it now. Um, I don't know about you. I love listening to audiobooks um, when I'm walking my new dogs, who are my former mother-in-laws, when I'm putting away the laundry and doing all that stuff. Um, I love I Eat Men Like Air by Alice Berman. I listened to Where the Light Enters by Jill Biden to prepare for her episode and Jamie Lee Curtis's Letters from Camp. Um, anyway, you should definitely go to Audible and go to audible.com slash Zibby and get your free month of fantastic listening. Thank you. I had such a great conversation with Meredith Masony, who founded That's Inappropriate, which is a thriving online parenting community with over 4 million people. She writes and vlogs about all the taboo parts of raising kids. Some of her funny frank dispatches have gone viral, like Go Ask Your Mother, which had 30.4 million views. Her most recent hits speak to the realities of pandemic parenting, like this is how homeschool is going, things mom say, quarantine edition. Her content has been featured by Today, Good Morning America, and many other places. Her new book is called Ask Me What's for Dinner One More Time. I hope you enjoy it. Hi. Hello. Thank you, Meredith, for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm delighted to be talking to you today about Ask Me What's for Dinner One More Time, Inappropriate Thoughts on Motherhood, which was like basically the Bible of my life here. So thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I love your shelves and how your books yep. are color coded, sort yep. of. Yes. Okay. I thought I was like, am I seeing something? But then I was like, no, <laughs> there are definitely colors. They are. Yes. Okay. They are. I know. Yeah. Wow. I've had it like this for a couple of years. And it looks great. It makes an extremely pleasant viewing experience. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad <laughs> I could have brightened the day a little bit with that. You did. <laughs> There's so much to talk about in your book and your whole like journey to becoming like a YouTube sensation and all of your your just success in general. But I wanted to start, if you don't mind, with like the worst part, I'm guessing, of of your life when you were dealing with your esophageal cancer and or wasn't cancer, your tumor and what happened then and how it made you basically have a whole new approach to life. Well, I guess, you know, everybody kind of has an origin story. So that would technically be mine because it did at the time feel like I was being punished, but it ended up being this gift. You know, I, I had been sick for a while and I just ignored it because I think as moms, we, we have a tendency to do that. We ignore and we say, I'll get to it later. And you end up coming last because you have to take care of everybody else's needs and finally, after several trips to the doctor and them just upping my heartburn medication, I finally demanded a scope. And I said, I need, I need you to look inside because I was starting to have a problem where I wasn't able, even able to swallow my food. My food was coming up. My pills were coming up. And I got him to do the scan or the scope. And well, we noticed something. There's a lump. Well, what does that mean? What's a lump? Why is there a lump there? What, what do you mean? Next scope, he just handed me off and said, I can't even be your doctor. You have an esophageal tumor. 
that has broken through your esophagus, which is why you aren't able to swallow food right now. And you have to see an oncologist. And it kind of, it went very quickly from there because I was 34, three small children, and basically handed off by a doctor who had ignored me for over a year. And I, you know, I panicked. I started to panic. And you start to have all of these thoughts, right? Because you're like, okay, if I die, who's going to do the laundry? Who's going to cook for these kids? Who's going to do all the drop-offs and the pickups? Who's going to do all the jobs that I do on top of, you know, the relationship that is with your spouse, right? And it's like, well, you know, you just, you panic. So I did a lot of closet drinking and crying, if we're being honest. And then I also realized after I panicked and cried about all of those things, I grieved about a life that I hadn't lived, which (laughs) sounds so selfish because part of it is selfish because you didn't get to do the things that you wanted to do. And then people will scold you and say, well, you got to be a wife and a mother. And it's like, well, yes, but that's part of what I wanted to do. There were lots of other things that I wanted to do that I put on the back burner because I assumed I'd have time. And now you're telling me after I did that part that there's no time. And so that became like this quiet shame I held because I was mourning a life that I was possibly not going to be able to live and then felt guilt about that because I think as women and wives, we feel guilty about everything. So luckily the tumor ended up being benign. They were able to remove it. I had to have three reconstructive surgeries, but it was this blessing because it opened up my eyes and it made me realize that if you want to do something, do it today. Do not wait for tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And not to sound too dramatic, but you could step off the curb and, you know, get hit by a car. You could, you know, there are so many things that could happen that nobody thinks about and it could be it. That could be, that could be it. And I was given I was given a gift and it completely changed my perspective on being a mom, being a wife, being a woman, eventually becoming an entrepreneur. It changed everything in my world. Wow. I'm sorry you had to go through that, but I'm happy that for all the benefits that it yielded and the way that you're able to sort of reframe what could be a negative experience and turn it into such a positive. That's like the essential, like (laughs) A plus therapy moves. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) and the thing is, is it's not like it was positive while I was going through it. I'm not going to lie and tell you that I was like, Oh, a tumor. We'll get through that. Like, no, I cried and I, and I screamed at God. And I said, why are you doing this to me? Like, what did I do? What, what mistakes did I make? Like, I know I, yeah, I was, I I was probably awful to my parents. You know, is this punishment for that? Is this, is this punishment for, you know, acting out as a teen and in like, what is this punishment for? Because you assume when this happens, I'm being punished for something as a, as a, as an ex-Catholic, I'm a Catholic light now, so to speak. But as an ex-Catholic, I assumed this was punishment. God was rendering some justice on my life. And it was difficult to wrangle with that and be like, look at these kids and think, you know, when the doctor looked at me and he said, I have to operate now because if this is cancerous and I go in and I go to remove it and it has spread, you're not going to be here for Thanksgiving. Like you don't have that time to wait. And that was just like, holy crap. What do you mean I don't have the time? Of course I'll be here at Thanksgiving. Like, why would I not be here at Thanksgiving? It's August. Like, of course, but but you don't, you don't know that. And so it was very trying during the time, but I literally, from the moment I, I opened my eyes and my husband looked at me and said, it wasn't cancer. You're going to be okay. I had just this relief and this feeling of a million pounds being lifted off of my chest. And I said, I've got to do something. I have so many things I need to do. I want to do everything that I said I was going to do from when I was five years old until now. Like I'm going to do all of it. And I've taken lots of risks. I've been told no a million times. I have failed, but I have also been so blessed to get to do so many of those things that I wanted to do from when I was a little kid. And I'll take it. What are a few, what are some examples of those things? Like what's something you always wanted to do? So I, I always wanted to be a comedian in some way, shape or form. I loved 
Saturday Night Live. Like, I feel like we, people are, I'm not going to speculate on your age, but I'm going to say people my age because I just turned 40. We got the, a really great crop of SNL actors that ended up going and doing so many things in their careers that are noteworthy and spectacular. And I got to watch that growing up. And I always said, I want to make people laugh like that. I want to do something that makes people laugh. And I also loved writing and I will, I am shameless. And I will tell you that I got a five on my state writing assessment when I was in high school And I was like, I'm going to be published someday. And, you know, I used to write for the local newspaper and I always said, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book. You know, I didn't know what the hell I was going to write about, but I was going to write a book. And so I've been able to check some of these things off my list. No, I've not been on SNL, but I'd like to think that the videos I make and the content that I create, you know, it's seen, I have videos that have been viewed hundreds of millions of times. So I can say, yeah, I didn't get, I didn't make it to SNL, but I don't care. Like I've been able to make videos that make people laugh and that makes me happy. That's amazing. As a comedian, I want a few more examples. Anything else? Because I'm trying to think now that you're saying this, like, what would I put on my list if I had two months, for instance? You know, that's a tough question. Are there things now that are, you're, you still haven't done that, or that maybe have come up since that you're like, okay, now these are next on my bucket list? Oh, I am always, so, so it's really, it's, what is shameful is my workspace. And I can tell you that I'm looking down at my desk right now and I have eight notepads with eight different lists because every day I decide I'm going to do something else and there's going to be another project. So I already have the idea for book three, whether or not somebody is going to buy that, I don't know, but I already have it. It's ready to go. I'm I'm itching to write it. But I also love to make t-shirts. I'm a t-shirt designer and I love to put my sayings and and do all of that. And like, I want my t-shirts sold in major retailers. And so I am pushing and working hard to do that. We also have a podcast, my co-host and I. And, and so we'd love to get this podcast out to as many people as we possibly can. It's called Take It or Leave It, an advice-ish podcast for parents. And so I have all of these things that we're doing and it's my goal to, you know, always at the center of every one of my, op- my, my biz quote businesses is to make sure moms are being heard and seen and feeling less alone because the struggle is real and we do face it each and every day. And I think the pandemic magnified that because we're we there in no time in history that I can think of have parents and children been locked together for such an extended period of time where they weren't either going and being social with other kids or going to school or or the parents you know, leaving the kids with a sitter or at a daycare or whatever. Like that's, I don't think that's ever happened. And so being able to be a voice to say to women, you know, out there like, hey, totally cool that you lost it today and and you're probably going to lose it tomorrow and you lost it eight times last week. Like this is not, like none of this is normal, but we're here together and let's talk about it. You know, the disaster that is virtual learning, the disaster that is, keeping our kids separated from their friends, celebrating COVID birthdays, which suck, all of those things. You know, I just, I think it's great that I get to fill a role in helping people feel better through this process. I was trying to think of other times in history. The only time I can think, and this is not to make this time, I don't know, I feel like this would strike the wrong tone, but I feel like in the Holocaust, a lot, (laughs) there are parents and children were stuck together. And I actually, during the pandemic, thought about that a lot when I was having the like, feel sorry for myself days at the beginning. Of course. And and how did people do that with the fear of death if their kids even spoke? I mean, it's not like people were so different. They were just like us, just, you know, maybe far less electronics, but it's not like people were built differently or had more patience or, you know, they were just like moms like us, but trapped and hiding. And I'm like, how on earth did people get through that? And then it made sort of this pandemic, like, oh, for God's sake, so I have to mop my nice house. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay. Well, and that's the thing is we were given a pandemic in a time where we had Netflix and grocery delivery. So I did talk about that a ton where it was like, yes, we're pushed together, but you know, like, there is an upside to this. We're being told to sit on our couches and watch TV. Yeah, our kids are driving us nuts, but by gosh, would I take this over other things that happen in history? Of course, every single time. 
but then it became so political and it became so much about everything other than what it simply was, which is we have to try and contain a virus that is spreading like wildfire across the globe. It became even places like social media where we could go to escape. It became a spot where you couldn't even go to do that because everybody was talking about those things. And I don't talk politics at all, zero. But what I can tell you is a person who believes in wearing a mask when they go out in public in order to keep somebody else safe and keep myself safe and paying attention to logically what we're doing to minimize risk, like these things are important, but you can't even talk about it without igniting a massive fire on social media. And that's, to me, that's crazy. I agree with you more. I posted about masks and everything myself a couple of days ago because I had been sort of hiding out on Long Island this entire time and recently came back to New York City to put my kids back in school. Right. This is where we live. And I came back and I was afraid to come back. And then like people were wearing masks, but not all people. I'd say maybe like three quarters. It depends on the day, the time of day, where you are. Wow. But that's I was, great like, though. I was horrified. And so I came back and I posted on Instagram and Facebook, expecting everybody to be like, no way, that's awful. Right. And that's what a lot of people who didn't live in New York said, but a lot of people who did live in New York were like, oh no, we've been here the whole time. And I don't think you saw that right. Or, you know, that's not what it's like in my neighborhood or, you know, what are you talking about? And I got like such pushback and I, it's not like I was alone. Like I was with my husband or I was with my daughter and I was like, am I like losing my mind? So like then the next time I got in the car, I was like, okay, I just counted 12 people in two blocks who weren't wearing masks. Did everybody see that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on, like I am seeing this. What, why is this political at all? Like if somebody were like walking off a street corner, I would say, watch out if a car was coming fast. That's exactly what I feel like I'm trying to do now. And I'm trying to like scream it from the rooftops. And yet people are like, no, 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 it's all good. <laughs> yeah. And it's been very weird to watch that. I think as a mother too, because we want to be like, this is going to help you. This is going to protect you. I need you to do this. I need you to listen because these are, this is what we're doing. And believe me, you know, I posted one thing once and it was such a 50, 50 divide. And I was like, Whoa, okay. So, you know, this is political. Apparently I don't believe it to be political, but we're not going to fish in those waters because I do believe that I fall under underneath the entertainment umbrella. And so when people come to our page, they want to be entertained. And that's what it is. That's part of my purpose. And so I say, okay, not a problem. We can do that. I can, I can do my best to entertain you. But it was also hard to be in that headspace when you were freaked out about every decision that you were making as a parent and a human being. We all had decision fatigue, you know, about everything. Can we go to the grocery store today or, or should we not? Like, I don't know. I heard, I heard on Facebook that three people at the Publix had COVID. Should we even go out? You know, I don't have any Lysol wipes left. I don't, you know, I don't have spray bleach. Like, what, what should we do? What should we do? And then other people who were just like, it's not real. It's not really has not what's happening. And it's like, you just would shake from the, the panic, the questions, you know? I, I feel like it hasn't totally ended. I mean, no. Like I was no. outside today and there were kids playing on the playground and I'm like, I just don't feel comfortable with that. And I just, I don't know. It's like one of those times where, you know, back to your whole point about parenting and, you know, how we each learn how to do it. I feel like this has also magnified the fact that you just have to like sort of go by your own compass, right? Like everyone's going to have different ways they raise their kids. Everyone's going to have different ways they approach the pandemic there's no right or wrong. It's just like, if you feel deep in your gut that like, if I really don't feel comfortable sending my kids to the playground, like no big, like I just have to listen to that. Even if my friends say, don't be silly. I don't know. I, and that's the thing is, I don't think there are a lot of situations right now where you can be silly, right? Because to you, these decisions and to 99.9% .9 of the people, these, it, it matters. You know what I mean? Like I got scolded. We walked past the playground. I didn't even let my kids on it, but I was doing an Instagram story because I took them to the tennis court so they could just hit the ball back and forth. Nobody was there. It was a court with a net. I walked past a playground. How dare you take those children? I was like, I didn't even take them to a playground, right? And so it's just the way people feel. And then they, because they're feeling this way, they want to then tell you how they feel. And then it just snowballs, right? And so um, we've been doing distance learning for several weeks and we're in Florida, which has been a hotbed for this after New York. You know, you guys had it first and then we sort of had this massive spike, but our schools didn't shut down. 
So, you know, my kids have been begging me from, from before school started, let us go back to school, let us go back to school. And we are in a very small county in Florida that isn't, knock on wood, having a spike so I started to get really torn. I was like, should I, should I just send them back? Because virtual schooling isn't working at all. They're not doing what they need to do. I am on them screaming constantly, get in them to your Pearson math. I can't find it. Well, I don't know where the hell it is. I'm in there trying to find the folders that the teacher set up digitally. And I can't understand the apps inside of the program, inside of the whatever. I'm looking at this agenda. I don't know where any of these things are. And I finally called her and I, I said, I need to schedule a Zoom with you because I don't know how to find the stuff you're telling my kid to do. And that's not an excuse because he should probably know where this is because you do Zooms with him. But I can't even find it to tell him to do it. I don't know how to do it. I technically own a tech company. So that's <laughs> scary. I mean, yeah, it should be intuitive enough that a right 40 year old woman could figure it out. <laughs> and I sat there and I was like, I don't see Pearson math, you know? And it's like, I assume there'd be an icon that said Pearson because it's a textbook. And I know what a textbook, you know, like I know Pearson textbook. So, so I, and I couldn't find it. And it was buried inside of each daily folder, not an app on the thing. And so I'm looking for it. And I, and so then I said to him, I need you to do the last 12 of these. He goes in and he did them. And he's like, can I go outside and play now? And it's like, well, I guess. I don't even know if I should be mad about this. So we have been on the fence about sending them back. And of course, masks, hand sanitizer, talking to them about the way they need to act when they're at school. I even asked, can I go to the school and kind of like watch the kids like change classes? No. Okay. You don't want me on campus. I get it. So I've even thought about like sneaking around the the school during the day to just peek. And I assumed I'll, I'll probably get arrested for that. But I think I'm leaning towards sending them back because the environment we have here is, is not conducive to learning. They're not learning anything. And then you feel guilty about that. So I, I don't know. I convince you in any way. It's been like two days of school for my kids and I was so scared to send them back. And I was like, you know, really just for socialization isn't like survival so much more important than that. And where is the line? How do you balance? But my kids' schools did let me go in and see. Well, one of the schools did. You know, I have a kindergartner, a first grader, and two seventh graders. So Mm. little guy's school, I got to see. And, you know, they're doing a really good job. One of the schools, I was more worried about the parents on the street and pickup because, like, they had thought everything through for the kids and not necessarily the parents. So I sent an email to, like, you know, the top five administrators being like, here are 12 free and easy things you could do to make this pickup and drop off better and safer. And right. that night they sent an email out to the whole school saying, here's how we've changed it. And I was like, okay, I made it. I made a difference. <laughs> Good. You know, right. Well, like, all the touch points have to kind of line up. Exactly. And those aren't the things that you're thinking about in a normal world where we're not freaked out to be six feet close, to, you know, within six feet of someone, someone, but it's so weird now, even to go out, even if you're in, like I've noticed I'm playing a game of like freeze tag in the grocery store because if somebody comes the wrong way down the aisle and I'm going to reach for something and I just like, I just immediately stop and I stand frozen until I can see which way they're going to go. And sometimes people just get right up next to you. And so then you're just like panicked and you're trying to like walk backwards while you're frozen. And you know, it looks ridiculous, but it's like, I don't like, God forbid I'm asymptomatic and you're 80. And I'm breathing. I have my mask, but like, I don't want to give you something. Like I would feel terrible if I found out in some way, shape or form that I perpetuated this. I'm doing my best, but it's weird. Cause even, cause like, we don't even know how to act in public anymore, you know? So it is, but I think we've scared the children enough in the sense of the mask stays on no matter what it does. You know, like you're not the uncool kid. If you keep your mask on at the bus stop, it is totally the cool kid thing to do. Keep the hand sanitizer in your pocket. I'm going to refill those, you know, make sure that they're full to the brim every day when you go in, make sure that you're washing your hands frequently, you know, and I know that they, I know they're doing that at the schools. I know they're making the kids wash their hands in between classes or at lunch or stuff, at least at the elementary level, because I did get an email about that. Now the middle and the high school, you got to hope you've given them that knowledge, right? Because I have a sixth grader who's a middle schooler, and then I have a high schooler. So I just have to cross my fingers and believe that my kids are going to do what we've been doing from day one, which is 
making the best choice we can for keeping ourselves and others safe. My mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law passed away from COVID over the last couple of weeks. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. The full medical odyssey with my mother-in-law that lasted six weeks, three in the ICU, three in a regular hospital. And it was awful and gut-wrenching. And my kids were sort of aware of it the whole time. So I think we're particularly sensitive to- I would say so norms. And, you know, it's so crazy. I I run into people who don't know and, you know, yes, I post about it, but not everybody's on Instagram and not everybody reads everything and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I like run into people and they're like, well, you know, aside from like the whole COVID thing, like how was your summer? And I was, I'm like, well, not good because, you know, (laughs) because of the whole COVID thing, like the whole COVID thing affects people and it might affect you. And if you would just take three steps back, maybe it wouldn't (laughs) like, anyway. Well, and I think to your point, because I have seen posts where people said, I don't even know somebody who's had it. And it's like, well, you follow me and I have friends who have had it. So you do know somebody, whether it's just on social media or not. I have several people in the blogging space who have come down with it and have been public about having it. If you want to just talk about the celebrities that have come out, like you do know, so saying I don't know anybody or it's not affected me is not really a true statement in that sense because we do know people. Three doors down, our neighbor, before we had moved in here because we moved during the pandemic, the whole neighborhood was on lockdown because the neighbor down the street had it. His wife never got it. His kids never got it, but he worked at Amazon and he got it. So yeah, you know people. And even if you think you don't, you do. Yeah. Well, now you know me too. And I know. Right. And now you're listening (laughs) to this and you know, you know, and that's, and I mean, that's, that's tragic. This is, this is absolutely tragic. Any way you want to slice that, this is a tragic event that your family endured and it's, it can't be taken lightly. So we have to mitigate risk where we can. Well, I'm glad to find sort of a kindred spirit on the whole thing. I feel like people are so different in different ways, but I feel like it's nice to speak to somebody who's so aligned. So that's great. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, I, I feel it. Barely talked about your book. But anyway, ask <laughs> one more time, inappropriate thoughts on motherhood. But I feel like we've gotten such a sense of you. There's so much in here, like mommy martyrdom and sex and parenting. And you know, oh. you have so many funny things and pointed things, raising an autistic child. Like mm. there is a lot in this book. So anyway, we obviously don't have time to talk about it all, but it was really amazing of you to share yourself like that with readers and the way you do all, all the time in your entertainment, so to speak. So it was really awesome. And so I just want to ask at least, do you have any advice for aspiring authors having written this and now onto your third and all the rest? I would definitely say the hardest part, I think, which most people say is actually just starting the book. Like, I think I said for a while, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to write another one. I'm going to write another one. And it wasn't until I just committed to saying, I'm going to put, you know, pen to paper, so to speak, like you have to get started. And once you get started, whether you self-publish, because I did self-publish my first or go with a publishing house, you really need to take whatever you're, like I said, the idea of this book was to say to moms, like you're not alone. And here are some examples of how we probably share a lot of the same things, how we've gone through a lot of the same things. And then you just got to figure out how you chunk, how to, how to chunk that out. I looked at this book and I think like how I'm going to look at future books as like chapter books for moms. Because moms don't have a lot of time, especially to read books. So the Audible version of this book actually performed very well, which I was excited to see. But anybody who picks up this book, you can open it to any section and read a story. And this doesn't have to be like a start to finish. This is pick it up almost like those. Do you remember the books as a kid? I just bought my son these for his birthday where it was choose your own adventure. And you could be like, oh, I got to go to page 87 now. And I'm going to, we're going to meet a dragon. So like when I was writing this book, I thought about that. And I was like, I want a mom to be able to pick this up and say, I just, I've got 10 minutes. You can go to any chapter in any section and read and have a story. And you don't have to keep reading if you can't at that moment. And then I have people who have, who have reviewed it and messaged me and said, I read it in four hours. My husband let me have the whole night off. I loved how she said that. I giggled because I, I, I could feel that one in my bones. And she read the book cover to cover. And she's like, I laughed. I cried. I laughed. I cried. I laughed more. I cried more. I pissed my pants. I laughed. And I was like, okay, great. I did my job. I did, that was my job and I did it. And I felt a lot of relief and excitement 
and kind of a euphoria from that, from reading these reviews. I got some shitty reviews, not going to lie. I don't know if I could say that. Sorry, poopy reviews. One woman told me that I am not funny and I should rethink my entire career. So So there's that. But overall, it was such a wonderful experience to read through those. And so I would tell any author who's getting ready, make sure that whatever the core of why you want to write this, get to that and stick with it. Don't let anybody divert you from that path. Because at first it was like, well, you know, you you definitely need to have around 400 pages. I said, of what? 400 pages? of Nobody needs 400 pages of this. This is a chapter book for moms. What moms don't read chapter books? I said, oh, they will. They will absolutely. Every every mom wants a chapter book because they don't have time for this. We're busy. So I stuck to my guns with that. And I think think it did what it was supposed to do. And hopefully will continue because I really would like to see this as the book that people give at the baby shower, at the, you know, at those types of events, because I feel like that's, it's like the stuff that people don't necessarily want to talk about, but we all go through it as moms. So true. Well, thank you, Meredith. Thanks for sharing all this. Thanks for writing. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks for helping so many moms. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I was very excited to see you holding the book and, and talking about it a little bit and having have the review for GMA and everything. So it was great because I didn't even know you had a copy of it. Oh, yeah. And, and so then when, when they emailed me, I was like, really? And I ran to, you know, I, and I found you in the feed and I went, oh, yes, this is so <laughs> exciting. So it was great. And then when we were, they told me we'd do the podcast, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I was so excited. Oh, good. Awesome. You too. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was wonderful speaking with you. And I appreciate that you read it and enjoyed it. And that makes me happy. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> All right. Take care, Meredith. Bye. Bye. Thanks again so much to Audible for being my sponsor. You can go to my site at audible.com slash Zibby for your free trial month of Audible. You get all their audiobooks and podcasts and uh, guided meditations and Audible originals and just so much. So go check it out. Please, please, please. Audible.com slash Zibby. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Music.